Good morning and welcome to Hyderabad. It's a privilege and honor to be here as part of this annual program and I'm extremely grateful to the organizing team, Dr. Chakravarti, Dr. Mehta and the RCS group and Yashoda Hospitals for having me here. In the next 15-20 minutes or so, I'll try to look at the rationale and the principles which we probably can access for choosing vasopressors for patients in shock which one to choose. The end of the talk, you'll probably realize we don't have much choice. The background of this story is that one of the most common indications why patients end up in the intensive care unit is for hemodynamic and ventilatory support, and shock is one of the common indications. Vasodilatory and cardiogenic shock would present unique challenges for optimization of hemodynamics and the metabolic disruptions they produce in the body. Theoretically, vasodilatory shock has been managed by vasopressors. That means you think that when there is vasodilatation, that's the only indication where vasopressors should come into your prescription. Over the years, when I was training in critical care way back in 2000, 2004, we were taught that before you consider vasopressors, fill the patients with fluids. So this fluid, and if you look at, you put it into the context of the talk we heard just a while ago, the context of fill the patient first and then start fluid, that paradigm may actually be shifting. You may have to consider a simultaneous fluid therapy with vasopressor or inotrope therapy for hemodynamic optimization because the longer a patient stays in shock, the poorer are his outcomes at the end of 28 days in the ICU. So having looked at all this, how close, or are we at all close to a one drug for all kinds of shock situations? That's what we'll try to answer in the next 20 minutes. We know this classification of inotropes, chronotropes, vasopressors, vasodilators, and inodilators. But essentially what they try to do is to increase the cardiac output, increase the heart rate, or manipulate the systemic vascular resistance with the ultimate goal of optimizing the mean arterial pressure. Despite all the advances in hemodynamic monitoring and optimization over the last 40 years, the only parameter that has been proven to influence successful resuscitation and outcome among critically ill patients is mean arterial pressure. And all the other parameters that come into question, like cerebral perfusion pressure, the abdominal perfusion pressure, the renal perfusion pressure, are all dependent upon your optimization of mean arterial pressure. So any agent which optimizes your mean RTL pressure is probably the best agent for reversal of shock. So we probably th seem to think that we have a toolbox that will tell us what all we can use for optimization of patients in shock. We have norepinephrine, we have vasopressin, we have epinephrine, we have terlipressin, and we have phenylephrine. What has left the toolbox for the last 30 years or so is dopamine. So it, it, it's an outdated tool, so it's no longer in our toolbox of hemodynamic optimization. But what might enter our toolbox in the near future, very shortly, is angiotensin II, which is already available in the United States for management of patients with septic shock after the uh, publication of a recent randomized controlled trial. We don't have access to it in India, but sooner or later we are likely to get it. So what do these tools essentially do? So you look at the vasopressors and vasopressor analogs, which bind to the, uh, the which essentially produce vaso, uh, uh, the, uh, vaso, uh, the receptors to produce vasoconstriction. You have the catecholamine derivatives and you have angiotensin II, which all produce a vasoconstriction and optimization of mean, uh, mean arterial pressure. So in the end of the day, anything that improves your mean arterial pressure optimizes your cardiac output without increasing your myocardial oxygen demand and extraction ratio is probably going to the best agent for optimization of hemodynamics among patients in shock. So if you have so many tools in your toolkit, you should know which, span, which spanner works for which, which nut. So the norepinephrine ha acts on both the alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors, increasing the venous and arterial tone and may increase myocardial contractility with the risk of producing cardiac arrhythmias and peripheral ischemia. 
vasopressin on the other hand does not have this uh, eff effect on contractility but it can produce water retention and release of coagulation factors that is a detrimental uh, side of using vasopressin. Epinephrine in the context of septic shock and any shock associated with hypoperfusion is a lactate generator. So when you use lactate as your marker of re successful or unsuccessful resuscitation, please remember that if adrenaline is on board, it itself could be a trigger of lactate generation. Angiotensin 2 acts on two receptors, the ATR1 and 2 receptors, producing an increase in the venous and arterial tone and increasing the ACTH, ADH and aldosterone reabsorption. It also produces tachycardia, which probably in the context of cardiogenic shock is a bad uh, omen, but it, it can produce peripheral ischemia to the same extent as vasopressin and can trigger thromboembolic events in critically ill patients. Terlipressin, although has a lesser effect on the V2 receptors when compared to uh, vasopressin, has the same non-endocrine effects as vasopressin and the same side effects as vasopressin. The only advantage of terlipressin is that it can be dosed intermittently rather than as a continuous infusion. So the authors of this paper are in the, in the faculty of this meeting. Uh, so the pros and cons of these uh, vasopressors um, would be their, mainly their effects on the cardiac output and the microcirculatory and organ perfusion. So if you are looking at a low systemic vasovascular resistance state, your vasopressors will be your first drug of choice. Severe hypovolemia would mean fluids. Cardiac dysfunction would mean a combination of a vasopressor and an inotrope. And a capillary leak, irrespective of whether you use a vasopressor or an inotrope, would not result in optimization of hemodynamics until the trigger for such a capillary leak and the damage to the glycocalyx has been successfully addressed. There are, however, certain unresolved issues in the context of choosing which vasopressor for what kind of shock. We do not yet know, despite all the advances in critical care medicine and hemodynamic monitoring, what adequate fluid resuscitation is. We are always taught that consider vasopressors after adequate fluid resuscitation. So what is adequate fluid resuscitation? There is no single tool which will tell you that yes, I have now given enough fluid for my patient. And I also don't know how much fluid is too much fluid. Yes, I know that in ARDS, a positive fluid balance of more than a liter and a half at the end of 48 hours will worsen outcomes, but that's only one cohort of patients with a specific clinical problem. What happens to others? What happens to my dengue patient? What happens to my pancreatitis patient? What happens to my trauma patient in shock? We don't know. Optimum mean arterial pressure. We now know that a mean arterial pressure of 65 is probably the bare minimum we can do. And we also know that if you target something more than 80, you are going to do more harm to the patient. But there are, in our own experience, patients who do much better at an a mean arterial pressure of 70 than they would do with a mean arterial pressure of 65. So what is our inability to maintain optimum MAP? What is optimum MAP? If I ask the audience what is normal cardiac output, there cannot be one specific answer. The optimum cardiac output is the output that maintains organ perfusion, which in a personalized intensive care context is different for each individual or different individuals with the same disease severity. Now the paradigm is shifting towards early initiation of vasopressors. How early is early? So do I start first up when I see a patient in shock in the emergency room as I give my bolus of fluid? Do I start vasopressors then? or I wait for half of the 30 mils per kilogram golden number, which everybody seems to be memorizing and you know, uh, replicating in emergency rooms. Do I wait for half that number or one-fourth that number? I do not yet know. At this point of time, from evidence-based perspective, there is no data on alternatives to norepinephrine as the first choice of vasopressor. Yes, there are believers in adrenaline. One of our academic centers in the South did a major randomized control trial comparing adrenaline and noradrenaline and showed equal shock reversal. But those results were not replicated in studies elsewhere. Uh, randomized control trials have not shown mortality benefit, although I do not personally believe that mortality is the only endpoint on which studies in critical care should be uh, evaluated against. What happens to vasopressors in non-vasodilatory shock? What happens to a patient with cardiogenic shock? What happens to somebody with neurogenic shock? 
do we use vasopressors are we philosophically correct in starting nor norepinephrine or vasopressin in a patient in cardiogenic shock whose hemodynamics are not being maintained and now the whole paradigm of critical care is about phenotypes now we have phenotypes of sepsis we have phenotypes of ARDS and we may still have phenotypes of cardiogenic shock as well so is there a role for genetic phenotypes how each phenotype responds to a particular class of drugs in a particular type of way so these answers are the ones which complicate the choice of vasopressors in a patient in shock so when i say that we may not yet see a replacement for norepinephrine for the for as a vasopressor why is it the front runner the vasopressor potency of uh, norepinephrine is due to its alpha 1 agonism it is a non lactate generator due to its minimal effect on the beta 2 adrenergic receptors it increases the cardiac index without increasing the heart rate which is probably good for a shocked heart there is neutral effect on myocardial oxygen consumption which may be a positive uh, factor in a critically ill patient whose oxygen supply demand equation is deranged and now we have gone to a non weight based microgram per minute dosing regimen for norepinephrine so individual body weight and the technical difficulties of doing it in the intensive care unit become uh, redundant when you now go to a non weight based dosing regimen for norepinephrine so all these factors make norepinephrine the front runner as a vasopressor of choice what about vasopressin right this is another molecule which has been in vogue there are believers there are haters and there are you know believers who use it even today its action is different in a shock state when compared to health so if you give vasopressin to a healthy individual the consequences you see on the heart uh, the peripheral blood vessels and the gut vessels are totally different when than when you give it to somebody in shock it's a powerful vasoconstrictor binding to the v1a receptors and like steroid a relative deficiency has been reported in septic shock and there is a hypothesis and a little bit of uh, data to support that it may maintain better renal perfusion compared to norepinephrine there is a lower incidence of arrhythmias uh, with vasopressin when compared to norepinephrine there is no big data on this one of my students is currently doing a randomized control trial about vasopressin first versus norepinephrine first in septic shock she just started her project so a couple of years we'll be able to give you whether it really is a good concept or not terlipressin has come into the market and is being used in non hepatic failure and non cirrhotic patients as well and in septic shock as well it's a synthetic analog of vasopressin with a greater selectivity for the v1a receptor it has a longer half life than vasopressin therefore intermittent dosing is possible but the flip side of using terlipressin is that it has a higher chance of producing digital ischemia which can lead to medico legal problems in the intensive care unit so amongst all this where does angiotensin 2 enter into the fray it's a crucial vasopressor of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis it modulates the vascular tone by binding to the ATR1 and 2 receptors and the ethos 3 data basically looking at angiotensin 2 showed a more rapid increase in mean arterial pressure over 3 hours decreased the dose of norepinephrine and improved the cardiovascular SOFA score compared to placebo and that's where the enthusiasm of using this non cardiotoxic non lactate gener generating vasopressor came into the picture and it may be especially effective in patients who have AKI in the context of shock requiring renal replacement therapy so if you compare these vasopressors head to head where do you look at you look at the was study which compared norepinephrine with vasopressin and did not show any difference in mortality between the two groups the vanish study also compared norepinephrine with vasopressin and did not show a significant change in mortality between the two groups the ethos 3 i've already alluded to and several other studies have compared epinephrine for with norepinephrine and epinephrine with norepinephrine plus dobutamine and did not find any change in mortality but arrhythmias and lactic acidosis were higher in the group that used epinephrine as the vasopressor of choice
the, the last aspect I would like to look at is what I alluded to now, vasopressin versus norepinephrine. Are we going to look at a paradigm shift in the near future? As the first line vasopressor in septic shock, a recent meta-analysis published a couple of months ago has tried to answer this question and seems to suggest that survival is probably better if vasopressin is used as the first drug of choice and it probably is better among patients with AKI requiring RRT uh, as, a, as a consequence of shock. And contrary to popular belief, the safety profile of vasopressin is comparable to norepinephrine and it does not confer any additional risk of gut or peripheral ischemia or myocardial ischemia when compared to norepinephrine. So the future may be in a select set of patients with shock, with AKI requiring RRT, we may have to consider vasopressin as the first drug of choice instead of norepinephrine. Is, I'll, I'll look at cardiogenic shock in a uh, perspective and see whether cardiogenic shock is any different. So the recommended vasopressors, if you look at in cardiogenic shock, the mean arterial pressure increase is higher with norepinephrine and epinephrine, but because of the myocardial oxygen balance that epinephrine disrupts, it is probably inferior to norepinephrine. And when you look at dobutamine and uh, vasopressin, their effect Dobutamine does not increase your mean arterial pressure. It may improve your coronary perfusion, but it does not alter your mean arterial pressure. So if you look at the algorithmic approach for vasodilatory shock, the first option is still to give fluids. And if the patient is still unresponsive to fluids, it is probably norepinephrine followed by vasopressin. And if angiotensin II comes into the market, maybe those patients requiring RRT, you need to consider norepinephrine and angiotensin II in, uh, as the second vasopressor of choice. In cardiogenic shock, it's always going to be a combination of norepinephrine plus dobutamine. There are studies which compared levosimendan with dobutamine and the results have not been encouraging. So it's not going to replace dobutamine as an inodilator in intensive care unit. So finally, how do you decide? Now, faced with the problem, there is a clinical pathway. You, base, you, you make your decision on core clinical science. Am I dealing with a warm shock or I'm dealing with a cold shock? Logic seems to tell you that if there is a warm shock, there should be a role for a vasopressor. And there is a cold shock, there should be a role for a vasodilator. But it's not so simple. So we fall back on the pathophysiological pathway on what receptors are involved in that shock and what is the mechanism of action. But as we have seen the data, just by looking at the etiology of shock and just trying to go by the receptors involved, we may not achieve our targets. So we probably have to then fall back on hemodynamic pathway. When I'm looking at a shock, I need to look at whether I'm looking at a shock with a preserved cardiac index or a, a shock with a decreased cardiac index. And what is this doing to my peripheral vascular resistance or a systemic vascular resistance? So I'm not going to look at whether this is cardiogenic shock or septic shock or what, what shock it is, because both types of shock can present with both vasodilatation and vasoconstriction. Cardiogenic shock is a systemic inflammatory response state and in, in, at a particular stage of cardiogenic shock there is vasodilatation and you need vasopressors. Septic shock in its last or in its later stages is a vasoconstricted state. So you need to use an inodilator. So if I am looking at somebody whose cardiac index is abnormal, abnormally low and systemic vascular resistance is normal, I would probably go with an inodilator. Whereas somebody whose cardiac index is good or high and a systemic vascular resistance is low, I would preferably go with a vasopressor or a combination of vasopressors. But we need to temper all this with evidence-based pathway. And today, so standing here, the randomized control trials and meta-analysis do not offer us an alternative to, uh, to norepinephrine as the first vasopressor of choice in a wide spectrum of patients with undifferentiated shock. So in the end, there is no ideal vasopressor for all situations. Norepinephrine is an all-weather friend, is a front runner for most situations. At this point of time, still vasopressin is the second choice in vasodilatory shock. Epinephrine could be a choice in cardiogenic shock. Angiotensin may replace vasopressin as a second vasopressor, but I think 
the future should be to look at a broad spectrum vasopressor that will answer all spectrums of the shock divide. Thank you very much and enjoy your festival. <laughs>